welcome back to the Socially Distant Sports Spa. Mike and Ellis in their places, ready for action. Uh, Ellis, how was your week? Very, very good. How are you, Steph? I'm all right, yeah. Yes. Sunburned again, but I'm okay. Yeah, Mike? The week was good, um, but then I got very, very, very drunk yesterday. Oh. And to, to the point where I, I almost... I almost uh, put, was going to pull a sickie tonight and, and really? not do that. Yeah, yeah. I was, I've been really bad all day. What, what are your hangover cure techniques? The thing is, well, the, the, my sort of main problem I get these days with the hangover appears to be that it's about 40% physical yeah, and about 60% psychological. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 I've been giving myself a severe talking to all day. Okay. About what the fuck I'm doing in my life. Yes. Which never, get, ever happened in my 20s. Get that, get, why are you doing that to yourself when you're 48 with, with a wife and two kids? You absolute twat. It's been like the, the soundtrack of my day on yeah. a loop since I got up this morning. Oh, I get. What did you I, say to one of your most valued friends? You, yes. you hurt their feelings, new. Well done. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So it's a valued friend. You've, no, you've known him for 22 years, and yet because you had a couple of pints of London pride... Yeah. You said some stuff. You thought something was funny. Yeah, yeah, you thought something was funny, didn't you? Yeah, well, do, do you know what? You've lost it. You probably yeah. never had it, but whatever you yeah. did have, you've lost, and now you've... you've oh, you get that as well. You, you get like a professional... Oh, yeah, the, give whole, yourself the as well. works. I don't do that. I just 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 bulk myself being a bad person, bad dad, bad husband. Yeah. We drank a lot of gin, that's the thing. Yeah. A lot of, I mean, Christ. My mate Steve and Matt came round, and then Vic from next door, the old-timer, came round. All socially distanced, of course, in the back garden. I just remember we were singing Tony Christie songs like three o'clock in the morning. Oh, my God. I was an absolutely ruined. Um, <laughs> and then Vic this morning, I got up, I never get up late, right? I got up probably 11.30 p.m. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wife's downstairs with the two kids. Yeah. Sorry, a.m., a.m. I was going to say, you're not yeah. up yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing this in my sleep. Vic was up right as rain. He, he's proper old school. He's he, top off. In the back garden, cup of coffee, paper, and he was. Uh, he's never been for a, out for a beer with us, yeah. and not a kept up with us, and we're all pretty accomplished drinkers. Yeah, and B, he's always left last. There's a very funny Live at the Apollo routine. I think it's Live at the Apollo by Paul McCaffrey, who Mike will know. Very won't be mine. They won't. They won't book me. <laughs> but it's a very, it's a very, very. They book every other comic in the UK has been on there, apart from me. Very, very good act, Paul. But he makes. Sorry, point... Paul's listening. You're a, t- you're a bunch of tosses. Don't bother. <laughs> Brilliant. Don't bother. I don't want to go on your show anymore. I wouldn't even do it. Wouldn't do it if you called. I put a, I put a Twitter hashtag on one saying, mention the fact that I was the only working comic in the UK left that I'd been on the Apollo, right? And, and I wanted to keep this going. And I had a hashtag saying, "Keep Bubbins off the Apollo." <laughs> And my agent phoned me up and said, listen, mate, this is, professionally, this is a bad idea. Why? <laughs> well, if, if they see that, you know, they're not going to book you for the Apollo. I said, but they don't book me now. So <laughs> fuck them. What's the difference? <laughs> and if you listen to this and you book the Apollo, stick it up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on, Al. <laughs> but he was making the point that your, your hangovers get bad in your 30s and then are terrible in your 40s. Oh, but f- then you get to Vic's age... And suddenly you're drinking red wine until six in the morning. At seven a.m. you're mowing the lawn, seemingly that's fine. That's what he does. Do you reckon yeah. it goes full circle? Then you think? Do you? Yeah, yeah. And that's McCaffrey's theory. And I, really? that's. Oh, I hope that's true because I, I can't deal with this. But honestly, you, you see, like elderly parents at weddings, and they're always fine. But isn't it? Isn't it the fact that you haven't got anything to do? So, being you know, a dad of kids of a certain age, yeah. you. Have stuff that needs to happen that day. Yeah, when you're not, twenty, it hasn't happened today, mate. I can see. You need to buy some that. Cheetos and some Sunny Delight to get over <laughs> it. Cheetos, and that's that's as high as your list for the day goes. Yeah, I'd say the most difficult thing is that my hangovers in my twenties and early thirties were probably moderate. I used to get hangovers, but not stonkers. Yeah. Whereas, but I was sleeping them off because after the age of twenty-seven, I was a full-time comic. So it was only I only yeah. worked for five years. Yes. And then your hangover's on a Sunday. Yeah. So, you, you know, if you've slept for 10 hours, you've, you've, you've worked through a lot of the, the, the aggravation. I but get what I call, it's a horrible sort of, wi- I call it the window of wellness, is when you wake up. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. I think you've escaped the hangover. Yeah. When all you really are is still a bit pissed. He's drunk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
So, then, but, so my hangover is usually start about 2pm. I would say that hair of the dog, though, I'm a total advocate of that. Having put it off for years, thinking, surely that can't be a good idea. In the last right. couple of years or so, I've got into the hair of the dog scene, and I, I reckon I've been I'm going to drive to work on a Monday morning. Haven't no, you? that's true. But you should, you, should, you should have had a bottle of beer at, a, at lunchtime, and that would have sorted you out, I reckon. I, I ate well all last week, and I was doing this. I've been walk, doing a lot of walking, a bit of exercise. It was all going really well with the weight loss. Yeah. And uh, today... It was like Eddie Hall esque. I just had, um, I had a fridge yogurt. I had two bowl, I had a fridge yogurt, chocolate fudge brownie one. Oh, nice. Two bowls, two bowls of shreddies. Yes. An egg custard tart. Nice. Toast and cheese. Yes. Just slabs of cheese with toast. Not 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 toasted cheese. No no no. So not cheese on toast then. Toast no, with no, cheese. Ch- cheese by toast. Yeah. <laughs> cheese near toast. A couple of cups of coffee, with probably. 12 chocolate digestives <laughs> and then I sent I didn't that sounds awful I'm not one of those husbands but I asked my wife if she was popping out could she bring me back a Snickers she brought me back a Snickers duo oh touch that went <laughs> I've just eaten everything I can find all day long just munch 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 that's good though and now I just feel awful if there's any consolation you look awful as well <laughs> <laughs> my skin I think crisis is a podcast my I think my blood pressure goes through the roof when I'm when I'm pissed as well. I thought you might be sunburned, but that's that's no, just no, red. I've been that's just redness. <laughs> this is just this is just blood vessels near the skin. <laughs> this is just my heart blood screaming, crying to get out. This is just my heart screaming to try and keep up with it. I had long been seeing my wife. We were still boyfriend and girlfriend, so I would have been sort of mid thirties, late thirties maybe, and um, I was convinced. I, I got out of shape. I went to the gym. I went really nuts on the treadmill. Came home, I was watching the world at war. Suddenly my, my fingers started tingling, right? My, my toes were tingling, my lips were starting to go a bit blue. And then I'm short of breath. And I think, fuck, I'm having a heart attack. Yeah. Jesus Christ. So I, I said to Kelly, I said, don't panic. I said, but I think I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> I, I remember sitting really still like that and just trying to breathe slowly while my wife phoned 999. And the ambulance took a while to get there. Seemed like a lot longer at the time. <laughs> I got to the hospital, right? They took me yeah. in, ECG, all that sort of stuff, you know? Yeah. And a uh, oh, oh, little side note, as a joke the night before, <laughs> Kelly had, so I got quite a big belly button, Kelly had drawn eyes <laughs> and a nose above my belly button. So looked, <laughs> looked like a screaming man. <laughs> 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 They're putting the pads on. I got the fucking <laughs> comical belly, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was all good, thank God. So that for the doctor was, I mean, doctors are, their sense of humour, obviously, if you, if you make sure the doctor or someone in the medical profession, they got a great black sense of humour, because I suppose yeah. they have to have, right? Yeah. So I said, what, what was that then? If it wasn't a heart attack, he said that was a panic attack, hyperventilation. He said all the symptoms are the same. I said, what will it happen again? He said, yeah, probably. He said, but just um, breathe into a paper bag if you can. You need to get some more carbon dioxide in, in, your, in your system, you know. Right. Breathe gently into a, into a brown paper bag and it should, you should be fine in sort of 15, 20 minutes. I said, so well, how will I know the difference? He said, well, if you have a heart attack, you'll probably die. <laughs> I said, oh, that's all right then. <laughs> I had a story once. These doctors, they were it was, it was, um, medical students. They were they were doing a, a post mortem, yeah. And what he did, he, he he sliced this old man's knob off. Have I told you this story? No, no, right, I okay. remembered this story. This like first year medical students, and then they all went out. Then they're on the piss, and he's got this old man's knob with him. So then he's Jesus he's in t- he's in town. Have I t- <laughs> so what he does, he 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 yeah. undoes his zip, his fly, and dear, then he puts oh, the old man knob there, and he's sort of in town. It looks like his dick is out. So this copper comes up to him and goes, hey, whoa, 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 no, put that away. And he goes, no. And he goes, whoa, 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 no, put that away. And he goes, I won't. And he goes, if you don't put it away, I'm going to arrest you. Right, for indecent exposure. So this student takes out his scalpel and slices the end of his penis off. <laughs> and the, the copper fainted. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Imagine. You imagine being the family, that poor bloke, right? You've lived a good life. You've paid national insurance, right? You've paid your income tax. You've raised a family. What can I do that's going to be noble after death? How can I keep helping people after death? I'll leave my body to medical science. Maybe they'll 
work on me and find a cure for something and I'll be able to help somebody yeah, even, yeah. even though I'm dead. When really, you're going to get on a slab and some student's going to cut your dick off for a laugh. Someone told me once, um, a rugby team at some medical school, they were warming up before a game with a head that they'd that they'd cut off a, a, a cadaver in a post-mortem. That'd scare the life out of me. <laughs> That'd be amazing. You play against New Zealand or something like that, and yeah. they're, they're trying to intimidate you with a hacker and just bring out a real human head to train with. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty dark art, isn't it? <laughs> I, I knew a bloke. He had a lovely accent. He was from the Burnley area, I think. And as yeah. kids, they were larking about in. It's not really, you know, Sasha de Stel territory. <laughs> but, they, <laughs> like that kid, but they were, they were larking about in a weir by a canal. <laughs> yeah, Burnley, where Omar Sharif's from. <laughs> and this bloke ju- jumped into this weir in this canal where kids have been playing for ninety years. But there was a rusty gate in there. Oh no! Which had been avoided by oh, generations God. of children. Oh. And this guy caught his bollocks in the rusty grate no, on the no, rusty no, no, gate. No, no. And then when he got out of the canal, hmm. my friend said. He was standing there, a load of pink string coming out of his balls. No, 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 no. Pink no, no, no. string. Dear. Pink string. A load of pink string coming out of his balls, <laughs> screaming he was, screaming. And that's the accent you like, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Ellis, you are going to go first this week. Like lots of people, certainly Welsh people, I would imagine, uh, in the 1990s, the Republic of Ireland were my second team. Um, and, well, I was tremendously jealous of their success because they qualified for Euro 88, Italian 19, USA 94. Hmm. Um, and if you ask me, it was all down to uh, one person, that's Big Chuck Charlton, who very sadly died this week. So this is a great video paying tribute to Ireland's exploits at the 1990 World Cup. Well, over the last three weeks, uh, we've shown you pictures from around the country which describe better than any words the extent of emotion which has surrounded the Irish team's involvement in Italian 90. Now, that video is fantastic because... Mm. Tremendous parallels between um, Ireland and Italian 90, where they reached the quarter final of the World Cup, going out losing to the hosts, 1 0, lost to Italy, and Wales at Euro 2016, of course, because there's this just tremendous outpouring of emotion. So, Ireland is, you know, football's played second fiddle to a lot of the Gaelic sports anyway. Um, certainly, in, in the eyes of the establishment, even though football obviously is massive in Ireland. Yeah, uh, but you see what it means to the people, mm. like the the scenes in the pub when Kevin Sheedy equalises against England in the group stages, and the pub is just going crazy. And I saw on Twitter because you know there was an enormous amount on social media um, yesterday yeah. because of his passing. You talk to Irish people, say who are thirty five, who might have been five in at Italian ninety, they actually thought Ireland had won the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter of a million people <laughs> to welcome them back um, from Italy. Yeah, yeah. So a huge parade. I mean, the foot. I watched a lot of the footage yesterday. The footage of the of the welcome home parade is absolutely fantastic. And the thing with the Irish as well, their record against us, for instance, you know, um, they hadn't beaten us in 1990. I don't think that the Irish up to that point had produced a John Charles or a Trevor Ford. Or an Ivor Old Church, you know. I think I think certainly up to the big, the Big Jack era, their yeah. best ever eleven wouldn't have been as good as our best ever eleven. Obviously, we'd qualified for fifty eight. But the thing with the thing with Jack, he was a fantastic manager, but also what a crop of players, you know. Liam Brady, David O'Leary, Ray Houghton, Ronnie mm. Whelan, Steve Staunton, Dennis Irwin, Roy Keane. You know when. Uh... When Welsh rugby sort of went in, there was like a, seemed to be a whole department of people looking into grandparents and trying to work out yeah. who was eligible. But those players you've mentioned there, to me, of you know, are Irish, yeah, either then, born in Ireland or born in, in in England of Irish parents that are very Irish. I mean, they, yeah, you've got I mean, guys like Mark Lawrence and Aldridge and Cascarino. Yeah, yeah a lot. There was of, a lot done on the grandparent rule. Yeah, there was, was it? And. Yeah. Um, you know, Aldridge's, it was his maternal grandmother, McAteer. Oh, it was Mickey Ward? 
I think <laughs> I think it was. Yeah. Well, t- I mean, <laughs> hilariously, Tony Cascarino was an Irish. They thought he was, but he could never prove it. They never really asked, and then it came out at the end of his career that he wasn't Irish yeah. and never had been. But he and, was and I, Tony Cascarino. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> yeah. But and and the thing with with Jack Charlton as well. But you look at that group of players, you know, Kevin Sheedy. Now, well, like I say, he's from Bill. Well, frustratingly, Kevin Sheedy's got a fucking Welsh accent. Yeah. If you look at interviews with Kevin Sheedy, you know he could he could have played for Wales, and also he would have been great in that Welsh team. Oh, yeah. But he chose to play play for Ireland, which is fair enough. <laughs> Go to a World Cup. Uh, yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and also once I think once they became successful, there was a lot of sniping about the plastic parties and stuff. Yeah. But in fairness, I think that completely reflects the the Irish story. You know, they've been they've been emigrated from Ireland f- for two hundred years. Absolutely. In a way that the Welsh didn't really, because of the Industrial Revolution, and we sort of colonised ourselves. Because it was, if you were out work in West Wales and North Wales, you would go to South Wales, where the steelworks were and where the coal mines were. So mm. we never, we never left Wales in, this, in the same numbers they did. He used to come in for a lot of stick for the way his teams played football. You know, long ball, and it wasn't particularly attractive to watch. And a lot of people said, "Well, you don't actually have to play football this way. If you if you look at some of the players you've got at your disposal." You don't need to play this very, very unreconstructed long ball like your Wimbledon or Cambridge United. But you, you, you ask any Irish fan, would they swap the success of Italian 90, USA 94, beating Italy, that Ray Houghton of course. goal? And that's the same in any sport, mate. When people yeah. wax lyrical about how you play. Being a Welsh rugby fan and watching Warren Gatland. Yeah. yeah. Warren Gatland's teams are, Warren ball, if, you take, Warren if you take a step back, reasonably dull. But that's all right because yeah. they were also reasonably winning, yeah. well, which was an experience the Republic of Ireland hadn't had before, and we hadn't had in rugby. The thing with Charlton, his philosophy, as in Jack Charlton's philosophy of football, was it was all right. I want, I want the fullbacks to kick the ball long. I, the keeper's not allowed to pass it, um, not allowed to uh, roll it out to his defenders. You've yeah. got to punt it up long, and the defenders. I don't, I don't want the centre backs kicking the ball long because it's more likely that they're gonna. Kick into touch because they're going to be kicking diagonals. So you get it to a fullback who kicks it long, and then you yeah. put pressure on them from the, in the final third, and that's all we want. And he wants a big, tall um, centre forward. And you just you're just knocking it to him. So it was Cascarino or Niall Quinn who were both yeah. you know well over six foot, and then Aldridge obviously was just chasing Irish Tony. balls down. <laughs> Irish Tony, <laughs> and it was it was a it was a kind of football that was that was loathed by the by journalists and football yeah. hipsters. But Ireland is a country, you know, f- four million people or whatever it is, and they were reaching tournament after tournament. Yeah. And as someone who, who lived in a country of three million people, I was incredibly jealous. I mean, he's also, he is hilarious, oh. like f- nodding off when the Irish team met the Pope. Yeah. And then waking up and assuming that the Pope was waving him, so he stood up and waved back at him and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> he used to routinely <laughs> refer to Liam Brady as Ian Brady. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> and apparently Niall Quinn would turn up and he'd say, "Bloody hell, what are you doing here? I haven't picked you, have I?" And he'd be like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, mate." All oh, right, okay. Well, you better train then. If you're... sorry, I've completely forgotten I picked you, Niall. <laughs> the other thing. Take the fag out of you, Mac Jack. <laughs> At Italian nineteen, you were saying ninety four. They were worried that the play- the Irish players would struggle in the heat, so he's making them train in three courts and loads of jumpers. <laughs> So, <laughs> it's pretty old school stuff. Superb. Well, when they won the World Cup, he was 30, 31 years of age. Yeah. Yeah. He looked yeah. a lot, lot older than that. Oh, you got Yes. Yeah. As did Bobby, he was you know, in yeah. his 20s, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he also talked about his brother saying he was the one who could play football. I, I just, I, I could stop other people playing football. What he said to Alf Ramsey, he said, um, why, am I, why, am I, why am I playing then alongside Bobby Moore? He said, I just want you to defend, stay back, defend, and tackle. And then he passed it to Bobby, and then Bobby plays football. He went, so why are you picking me then? He went, oh, I, I don't always pick the best players for the team. <laughs> <laughs> you serve a Enjoy place, your game. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, coach. I loved what he did with that Ireland team. He loved it. He loved it too, you could tell. I know this is hypocritical and, and inconsistent. Ray Houghton's strong Glaswegian accent, I always thought, made him the weirdest one of the Anglos. 
because <laughs> you expect a lot of Scousers to have Irish heritage, and you expect yeah. a lot of Londoners, in particular, especially certain parts of, of Northwest London, to have Irish yeah. heritage. Yeah. It was the fact that he sounded like like Rab C. Nesbitt, but was playing for Ireland. I was thought it was the weirdest one. But there are obviously there are, there are loads of Irish in Glasgow. Yeah, I always think people's decision on who they're going to play if you if you're dual qualified or multi qualified for countries. I'm always fascinated. Well, it's like Ryan Giggs chose Wales, and he obviously could have played for England. No, he couldn't. This is could a common have... misconception. Ryan Giggs was eligible for Wales and Sierra, Le- Sierra Leone. There is a really? famous picture of Ryan Giggs yep. turning up for England schoolboys when I he's about he was born 14. In no, he was born, no, he's in, born in Cardiff. In he was ah, born in Cardiff okay. to Welsh parents, but he was raised in Manchester. So he moved to Cardiff to Manchester when he was a little kid. And the yep. thing with schoolboys teams, that's completely based on where your school is. So he played for England schoolboys because his school was in Manchester. Oh, right, yeah. In the yeah. same way that it's a common misconception that Michael Owen was eligible for Wales. He never was because he was born in England to English parents. Yes. Nowadays, Michael Owen would be able to play for Scottish Wales. dad, actually. What, Michael Owen? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, because yeah. his father played for Everton, didn't he, Michael yeah. Owen? Yeah. yeah. But the reason we lost players from that area is that you had to cross the border because That's the right. nearest Labour ward was in Chester, wherever it was. So even though their house was in Wales, you had to be born in England. You hear about like certain players making a mad dash over the border because they either yeah. don't want their kids born in Wales or don't want their kids born in England. Mel Nurse, the, the Swansea City legend, was playing for Middlesbrough and his wife went into labour and yeah. he went, get in the car, and he drove it to Swansea. Oh my God. That's not the quickest be, way. Because he wanted his son to be a jack. Can That's you brilliant. imagine? Not just Welsh. That's not good so enough. Yeah, Go yeah. through 200 miles of Wales to get there, which yeah, is yeah. labour. Now, you know... Rills Wales, love. Rills Wales. The three of us... No! Are, Hold it in. The three of us are parents. Can you imagine explaining that to your wife? Get in the car! It's absolutely despicable. <laughs> I read that in his autobiography. I could not believe what I was seeing. He absolutely saved Swansea City, Mel Nurse. He runs all of those B&Bs and stuff on the seafront. And he put it really... Oh, yeah. I've we stayed were... in one of those for my stag night. It was horrific. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, she's like, how many of you are there? I said, uh, 17. Yeah, we can get you in. I said, okay, cool. I mean, but I think there's like a three-bedroom house in Swansea. So, so we had 17 lads, right, for my, for my stag night. All fairly big blokes. The more you tell me about your stag do, the worse it sounds. Oh. <laughs> In the, sounds in the bad. morning, so we had 17 of us. One of the sinks came off the wall and whatever else, right? In the morning, we came <laughs> out for breakfast. High hijinks. But there's 17 for breakfast, bacon and eggs, right? So she sort of, I think there were like some sort of partition between the family back room and the front room, which is used as the, as the breakfast area. Right. She sort of pulled this partition back and put another table in there. So we had 17 of us sat down at a table and like a temporary table. Yeah. But the temporary table was in the living room, right? And the and the kids were just sat down on the sofa watching telly. <laughs> we're like eight eight hairy ass people with hangovers having bacon and eggs in front. Of they the, the the little push button tellies they had. They, they didn't have ITV two, but they they did have ITV twice. <laughs> so be number one would be BBC Click. one. Number two would be ITV. Number three would be ITV again. There was there was a sign on the door there saying please remove muddy work boots, and then in the room saying do not eat curry in rooms. <laughs> it's very yeah. specific. My first gym in Cardiff I trained in it was a bodybuilder's gym, which is uh, of course it not, was. There, not, not there anymore. So my first day there was the bloke, I was 18, essentially trying to sell me steroids. So I wasn't interested. <laughs> but they had a locker room, but with no locks on the locker. So uh, I said, I said, well, how, can we, how do we lock the lockers? Yeah, you don't, you haven't got to lock them. And then when he came down the stairs from the locker room, and they're all big meathead steroid bodybuilders in there, right? There was a sign when he turned round, the, the width of the place, above the stairs up to the locker room, saying, any McCourt stealing from these lockers will be very very severely dealt with, i.e. fucked up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> well, you wouldn't mess with them, yeah. Just trying to sell an 18-year-old bloke gear, like, first day in the gym. Oh, my gosh. I'll get anything you like, mate. Anything you like. Oh, I'll find me, honestly. Do you want to do do test? No, I don't know. I don't anything. What's Just test? Came here to plank. Testosterone. <laughs> oh, oh, right, right. What's right. test? Well, I do. I know what testosterone Fair is. I, I don't know the lingo, do I? Can we send Nell somewhere to try and score some steroids? You know how in Bill and Ted, they, they fantasise about being taught how to play the guitar by Eddie Van Halen. Yes. Mm. I routinely fantasise about taking three months off work and parenting and just trying to yes. get stacked. I'd love to train you. Yeah. 
I'd love it. Give you a proper Dr. Z. Like, don't ask me what I'm injecting you with. <laughs> yeah. Just trust me. Just go with this program. Let me inject you with whatever I see fit. <laughs> and do as I say for three months, and let's see what happens. Oh, do you know, bloody hell, do you know what happened to me on a few days ago? You know, you know I'm, I'm in this, this bid to become the fastest mile runner, 39-year-old oh, yes. father of two there is. Yes. Mm. There's a very, very posh public school a few miles from where I live. And they very graciously, uh, in lockdown, opened their athletics facilities to the general public, right? Lovely. So they've got a track, and I thought, well... Um, yeah, so I thought, I saw th- I thought well, I'll, I'll see how quick I am on, on the track then for running a mile. Spikes on. Because as I said... You know, I was about 21, 22, seven miles, seven minutes, and when I was about 35, seven minutes. That's the, but I, I'm st- I've stalled about 750, right? Okay. So I, I, I ran four laps of the track, yep. plus nine metres, which is a mile. Lovely. Well done. And I yeah. looked down on my watch. It was like 6.06. I thought, fucking hell, I'm back. I'm back and I'm faster than ever before. So I was delighted and as I uh, walked um, back to the bike so I could cycle home I just randomly asked some bloke I said by the way this is a 400 metre track he went no it's a 300 metre track <laughs> it's a 300 metre track 409 metre short <laughs> why would you even build that what's the point well I'm assuming it's a safe it's a space saving um, well don't have one then thing. save loads of space have you seen the video of the guy who was running the 200 metres last week they did. Um, they like streamed three different athletes in three different venues, simultaneously sorted out the start gun. Oh, I did see that. Yeah, yeah. And this guy runs, and he finishes. Well, he, he breaks the world record. Yeah. And finishes, you know, a good twenty meters ahead of his competitors. At which point, Steve Cram on the commentary went, "Something's wrong here." <laughs> And he's run 15 metres less than everyone else. He started from the wrong place. <laughs> he paced it out, did he? Yeah. Just did, two, did 200 paces, but a cone down. <laughs> That'll do. I'll start can, here, lads. How can a professional athlete cock up like that? But how can you get to the point where you've you, you've managed across continents to sort out the start gun to go yeah, at the yeah. same time, but no one's gone, that's 185, that is, mate. The problem with these things at the moment, these TV things that are using... Uh, you know, Zoom and whatever else, right? Yeah. That are on TV. No one's asked the question, the vital question is, is why? Yes. Right? Yeah. Not, not can we do it? Why, why are we doing this? Should we do so, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, yeah. There must be repeats you could put on. You must be able to put, it like a, a, put, put a, like a Bond film on or something. There's, there's some gig on. We, obviously, Ella and I both do stand-up. Yeah. There's some gig on this week, and I feel really bad for a lot of comics that are struggling big time because, well... And that's a conversation for another day about um, funding for, for comedy. But um, they're doing a comedy gig, like a like a drive drive through drive yeah. through comedy. Gig. I've seen footage of them. They look uh, that's got to be unplayable. They look isn't tricky, it? yeah. Well, people tricky. honk their horns. People honk their horns when they find stuff funny. Oh, well, really? God. Yeah. Imagine. Oh no, that's that's. But the problem is with that. That's off putting. If people are if people are honking, you get honked out, off. Yeah, you, you, a you could get honked off, and B you could get. I mean, I'd love to get honked off. off. It's been a long time for me. <laughs> Go to a drive through for a honk on. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, let's go to the drive. Fancy honking me off? Where have you been? I got honked off in uh, in High Wycombe. <laughs> what a gig. That's my new name, Honked Off. <laughs> it's such a good name. Oh, that could be our code. No one will know we're talking about. <laughs> Fancy. You look, uh, you look knackered, mate. Oh, I got honked oh, off last yeah. night. <laughs> yeah. Twice. <laughs> God, I haven't honked off like that since I was about 18. <laughs> when you read these revelations, you don't see it so much in the, in the papers these days, right? Yes. They used to love, they used to love the tabloids. You know, my seven times a night with England. Style, oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was really always thinking, every bloke was thinking, seven times in a night? God, that sounds awful. Why the, <laughs> ha- why the hell would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, if you're doing it seven times in a night, your first effort is fucking poor, right? Because <laughs> it should it should take that should take a while to do it properly the first one, you know. And if you're some sort of sex god, yeah, then the first one should I mean should like be to say the that, duration of the seven. Yeah, and also 
I used to say that, that when I was, uh, you know, when I was a younger man, I, I didn't, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd have a, I'd, I'd have a spell of uh, you know, inactivity between sex and you know, maybe a couple of weeks off or whatever. But normally a because of weeks off, you're just getting your fitness back. <laughs> I never, I never thought. That's what it sounds like. It's like, can you play this weekend, Mike? Oh, I, can, I can't. Yeah, no, yeah. no I'm honking tight, for lads. a couple of weeks. I'm kept tight. Kept tight. <laughs> but, uh, I honked off on Saturday. I'm it's not good. Seven times a night. I can just remember thinking that'd be bloody torturous. Yeah. Where's, yeah. No one's enjoying that, are they? Yeah. The, the, and by the third time, you're just shooting compressed air, I'd imagine. You're, you're ready for round six? Not really. I sort of lost interest, if I'm completely honest. Yeah. Friction burn <laughs> penis, shooting compressed air out of it. Hey, hey boys, boys, imagine having your dick like that constantly for the rest of your life. Yeah, sounds absolutely <laughs> awful, actually. I've got stuff to do. Martin, imagine having your dick like that constantly for the rest of your life, like <laughs> <laughs> um, no I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll have a, a couple of months off because I'm so appalled at how perverted I was. That, you know, <laughs> proper grief. Like you talk about like a hangover shame. The shame after sex sometimes. <laughs> Some of the stuff I've done, like, honestly, I'm so appalled at myself. <laughs> it takes me about two months to get over it. Seven times a night with England star. <laughs> God, people were obsessed with numbers then, weren't they? <laughs> Like you, and you knew everybody's size. What's she like, 36D, mate? <laughs> no one says that anymore. No, Because they've got true. plenty of fish on the internet. No one says, what, what, what's she like, mate? 36D, mate. Doesn't mean anything to youngsters. No. What's she like, no. 36, 24, 36? No, no one cares about how many times you've had sex in a night anymore. Yeah. No one cares about what what, what your vital, vital statistics are. I think are. you're speaking as a 48-year-old man there, Mike. You know she's on the papers. I'm, I'm, well, I don't know. I don't know. Seven t- are, you still reading the day- my, are you still reading the day? My Daily seven times a night with England star. When else have we saw that? <laughs> I'm going to Google it, actually. <laughs> you Google, Google seven it. times gonna, a night I'm gonna Google with England star. My seven times a night with England star. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were discussing Jack Charlton. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fitting tribute. Yeah. Rest in I peace, would say. Jack. It's, it's like no one knows. Gonna... <laughs> Do you remember? Like, it, it was a. <laughs> God, rest, God rest his jolly soul. I can remember vividly going to my grandmother's house on a Saturday night. You know, I, I, she used to have the sun delivered. So I was a youngster, like when I was 13 years of age. Yeah. My dad had the Express. My nan and granddad had the sun, right? Yeah. So I thought, so I love it. Like a page three. When you're 13 years of age, there's no internet. So I, thought, well, I couldn't nick the sun. She'd know I'd nick the sun. I couldn't nick page three. She'd know I'd nick page three, right? Yeah. So I said, take a uh, couple of copies of the sun out of the uh, basket by the side of the fire. Go in the back room. I just go in the back room now to read the sports pages. <laughs> right? I'll just go in there and trace page three. <laughs> I said trace page three. Still, last eight of Italian 90. Very impressive. Beating Italy at USA 94. Fair play to obviously, uh, beating England for the first time at Euro 88. Ray Houghton Header. Superb. Didn't qualify to the group stage, to the uh, knockout stages, but what an achievement. Uh, Mike, what's your clip for round number one? Right, I've picked... Um, this was sent in to me by a listener um, of uh, indeterminate name. <laughs> and uh, this is great. I mean, th- obviously football is a big part of British uh, British life, but it has been for hundreds and hundreds of years, like since well before association football was around. Yeah. And this is a clip of one of these town football games that used to be you know, played all over the country and a few places that these things are still going so this is this is the town football match in a place called Atherstone just have a little look at this clip So what strikes me with that? There's a few things that strikes me. Is is one I don't I just don't know how the ball ever moves. All right, I, I can't see how it moves from A to B. Yeah. Secondly, I can't believe like in the sort of health and safety world we live in now. I can't believe this game is still allowed to go on. And there's there's one bit in this clip when the police, this police in like high vis vests, just sat watching it, having a great time, you know. And then, but it looks. There's a bit right at the end where there's the fella defending like some sort of doorway of a shop, it looks like, and they've ripped the shutters It's the St. Giles bookshop. So he's balanced on some fella's shoulders to keep himself from falling off the shoulders. He appears to be grabbing onto some 
high voltage <laughs> electrical cable. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's full on like kicking people in the face yeah, if they yeah, try to yeah. get into, into the shop. Yeah. And it just looks like like a combat 18 yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just it's just really hard blokes everywhere covered in blood kicking shit out of each other and then you see the mayor the mayor looks like with his with his gold with his uh, gold chains on and he's filming <laughs> on his phone <laughs> loving it absolutely loving it and there's and there's stewards hilariously and there's a bit right to the oh, imagine there's being a, a steward for right, that. you talk about being a bloody there's a bit right to the start of the video where billy is strangling a bloke. And the steward's going, whoa, yeah. whoa, 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 now, Billy. Whoa, 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 now. whoa, now, Billy. And it's, it's, it's... Well, they always say that football came from those games, right? And I, I don't think they did. I mean, I think what came from those games is, is like street violence. Well, do you know what it's like? It's like... Um, it bears no resemblance to football, like does it? It's like cheese rolling crossed with the UFC. <laughs> <laughs> It's run for the, the t-shirt. That's run for the t-shirt. <laughs> it's one of the most violent things I think I've ever seen. It's been played for eight hundred years, or over eight hundred right. years, and the BBC did a, a really brilliant documentary in the mid nineties. It was one of their flagship documentaries called "Kicking and Screaming," and it was a six part history of football. Yeah. Okay. And episode one was called something like "In the Beginning," and. The majority of it is is on YouTube. Not all of it's for copyright reasons, but in the first episode, if you go to about I don't know three or four minutes in, they cover one of these games that's been played on the Orkneys in Scotland. Oh yeah. So you've got the the uppies and the doonies. So if if you live at the top end of town, you're an uppie. Bottom end of town, you're a you're a doonie. And it's it's effectively a big sort of rolling mall, I yeah. suppose. It's like a three hundred man scrum. Yeah. But there was none of the fighting that we saw in, in this clip. The English one just looks really violent. There's people that just... The English one is fighting, yeah. whereas the, the Scottish one that I've seen... I'm, we'll, we'll put it on the yeah. YouTube channel. The Scottish one that I've seen... Is pushing and shoving. You know, that, that scrum is pushing and shoving, but it doesn't move for hours and hours and hours. And suddenly the ball pops up from somewhere, and then they throw it, and then they score a goal, and yeah. great, you know, 1-0, and they've won. And that one, the Scottish one... I think if I lived in that town, I probably would get involved in that one. The English one. You'd be on the one, fringes, though, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd be on the fringes. It the is. English one, it no is. chance. Because <laughs> I don't want to get my jaw broken oh. in the doorway of an estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not a diva. For, but... for, for a game where the only rule is you're not allowed to kill a member of the opposition. When they talk about these, these bylaws, people have to trot out. I used to go to the girl who lived in Shropshire, and there was some little bylaw that you could shoot Welsh people from the castle turret yeah. you know with a with a longbow after me yeah right? yeah there's the yeah. one in chester as well yeah but obviously if you did that you get arrested for murder right i mean <laughs> yeah it, just because it's a local bylaw from like 1250 doesn't make it doesn't make it so does it you know what i mean <laughs> so when you say yeah it's okay mate what happened uh i poked the guy's eyes out r- ripped both his eyes out tore his ears off uh kicked yeah, him in the disemboweled him yeah but i didn't kill him so i'm i'm, 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 I'm absolutely fine your honor <laughs> I was having a game of football. It's all in the bylaws. Yeah. You yeah. say, well, the bylaws mean nothing, mate. This is the law. This is the the law of Great Britain. I watched it a couple of times. There's one bloke doing an awful lot of off the ball stuff. <laughs> and if if you read the Wikipedia entry, it says something like, you know, there's a general code of conduct. However, it's always flouted. <laughs> however, pre-existing tensions might be exacerbated amongst townspeople. Okay. So if you hate. Gary from down the road because he, he he got off with your girlfriend, then you're going to use this yeah, as an exa- as, a, as a fantastic excuse yes. to beat up Gary from down the road. Well, the bloke's got his like top ripped off. You know, he's quite he's quite heavily tattooed, covered in blood, and he's just I couldn't have thought my God, this is brilliant. I thought to myself, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'd love to play this game if if they do that in Barry. Oh fuck it, all, mate. There'll be deaths. But would you have got involved if there'd been? Of course you would, especially if you're a young, you're a young, young bloke. Yeah, of course you would. Testosterone, mate. If 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 I if I knew I wasn't going to die, I wasn't going to get stabbed, I wasn't going to get end up in court. Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love a scrap. <laughs> I, I'd love a rag of me. At distant pod. <laughs> No, I've got a horrendous feeling that our live gigs are going to be unplayable because it's going to be 350 blokes who want to have a oh fight with my Mike. God. You think you're fucking hard on a podcast now? Think you're fucking Kimbo Slice, Brett? Let's have a fucking go then. Oh, fucking bring it on, dickhead. 
me and Steph heroically trying to keep the whole live show moving. <laughs> Ellie that says you want to get involved. <laughs> so, Steph, what's your clipper? <laughs> I've got a bit of Mike's blood on me. Yeah, Steph, I've been splashed again. <laughs> Where's Steph? He's getting honked off in the car park. <laughs> Some distant pod group he's honking him off. <laughs> <laughs> Just briefly as well, speaking about being honked off. Right? <laughs> Which we were. I said to my, I remember saying to my missus once, I said, well, I said, but would you, and we've been married a long time now, faithfully to each other, right? I said, well, if I ever, like, um, if that ever happened, if I ever got honked off by somebody, right? <laughs> In a car park. <laughs> well, I was meant yeah. to be doing stand up. I said, you know, what, <laughs> would you, would you freak out if it? it she said, of course I would. Yeah, of course. I, I can't believe you asked me the question. I said, well, no. I, I, I'm assuming you would freak out, but I'm just I wanted to confirm it. I just don't understand why you would freak out. And she's like, what do, you mean, what do you mean why? I said, well, I don't understand why that that happening to me would would would, would really upset you. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't. It's well, that person's just doing something that you don't want to do. <laughs> this is the point I was trying to make to her, right? It's not like you're not, she's not stepping on your toes. I mean, you don't want to do it. So why why have you got a problem with her doing it? The, why is that um, offensive to you? If she came uh, on and put the bins out, you'd be fine with it. <laughs> it's like affairs, isn't it? The, the reason that affairs are so, you know, people talk, I, I've never had an affair. I don't, I don't want an affair. Because they're not real, are they? I've, I've told a mate to my I've had an affair. Oh, it's great, mate. Oh, it's great, though. I said, what, what's, what's great about it? Oh, it's great sex. She never phones you up and says, uh, what are you doing Thursday? Oh, I don't know, why? Come over, at six o'clock, my husband's out. Oh, yeah, what do you want to do? Just put the kids to bed, uh, paper the back room, uh, <laughs> take the dog for a walk, fucking clean the bog. Oh, right? it's, it's brilliant, mate. We're, it's fucking I go over to house, right? We're really tired, and we watch the first 20 minutes of a Netflix thing, and then she falls asleep, and then I wake her up, and then she gets angry with me, and then, and then we both go to bed, and... And then I fall asleep, and then she wakes me up at midnight and says, you, you haven't done your teeth. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> oh, bang it. It's brilliant, brilliant, it is. And when we have rows, I mean, couples row, I just think, do you, Cal, this is, uh, you know, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> Don't kid yourself that you'll meet somebody else that'll be better than this. <laughs> it will be for a week or two. Oh. Well, then it'll just be shit. That's just relationships, isn't it? <laughs> well, I love you, and she loves me, but that's, it let's not kid ourselves. It's shit. <laughs> it's not Hollywood. It's real life. We once oh. watched the... You know when the CBBC finishes at, like, 7 o'clock? Yeah. Yeah. We'd yeah. be so knackered sometimes when the kids were younger. We'd be sat on the sofa looking at that test card for about an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah Couldn't yeah, even be yeah, asked yeah. to turn the channel over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just watching the CBBC test card saying, see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Completely zoned out. We <laughs> were ripping each other's clothes off. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my my son wakes up every morning at five. It is too early. That is too early. If Kelly's listened to this, and the thing is, Kelly listen, Kelly loves this podcast as well. Not anymore. So uh, I just want to say to, uh, on the record, I love my wife. I mean, I love my son, but at 5.02, I go into his room and I look at him and I think, are you thick? <laughs> You've seen the time. Are you thick? Funny Stand there too, are you pointing thick? at your watch. You to a one year old. Thick. Are you thick? Man? Come you're on, thick. mate. Because what's going to happen now? You're going to be you're going to be shattered, and at eleven forty-five, you're going to fall asleep in your scrambled egg. And then, then where are you? It's you or him now? No, the same. Yeah. <laughs> I lo- I love an espresso. You can't give a one year old espresso. They're too young. Why don't you start giving kids coffee and tea? I don't know. When did you... For, I mean, you had it for breakfast, well, I was you? young. I was coffee yeah. from a young age. Yeah. Ju- certainly my, junior school. Certainly like yeah, my, my, my friend Sean Harris used to take a flask of Mellow Birds with her to primary school. Twelve, maybe? I know twelve. Twelve is half decent age. Yeah. Does Ben drink tea after, like, a gimmerick beer? No, no. You look, juice, water, milk. I keep trying to make him have a little sip of beer. Like we, we had a presentation online for his rugby club the other day. Yeah. It's so like a Zoom presentation, so I opened a can up. I thought, well... It's traditional to have a beer presentation. And I just said, have a little, do you want a little sip of this, mate? You went, no. I said, do you want a little, little sip of daddy's beer? Just taste it. You went, no, I don't. Want a bit, little bit of daddy's skag? <laughs> Come on, mate. Do you want a, a line? Go on. You in can, the outside bog? I, at, your, at, your age, you, at your age, you can smoke it. And then when you get to my age, you can inject it. Eh? 
<laughs> Joe, oh, go on, have, a, have a talk on that, go on. Have a talk. Have a, go on. Have a rip, have a rip on that. <laughs> have a suck on that, go on. Hey? Go on. Go on. Have a... Most, uh, most improved player deserves something. <laughs> Right, my clip for round number one is... <laughs> round number one. God. <laughs> uh, is inspired by Ellis's attempts to touch his toes a couple of weeks ago. Mm. This is Roy Jones Jr., the legendary four-weight world boxing champion, uh, who has never touched his toes until a man with some chisels and a lot of aggression... Starts cracking the life out of his back. There we go. That was easier? Yep. Right. And do right again. There we go. Perfect. So this is going to be a, a tough one here. That one's... Uh, yeah. uh, you got a good poker face, but this is a rough one. Better uh, uh, be super loose. Ah! Uh, this guy is Dr. Bo Hightower, and I know. What, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> the neck snaps are the ones that scare me uh, every time yeah. I see them. It looks like that's something that could go wrong. Do you know, I, I, used to, I used to think the chiropractors were complete snake oil salesmen, right? Yeah. Very, very honestly. Yeah. So I, I had a lot of back problems over the years, and I went to different people in chiros, and they were always rubbish. And I'm not gonna, I won't talk about Dr. Z, but when... But my wife was going to a chiropractor up in the, the Welsh Valleys, and I started, she said, honestly, give it a go. And I went up there, and it changed, sort of my hip out, it sort of everything, it was really good. Yeah. But, but she does that thing that Roy Jones is having done yeah. to his neck, to me. Yes. And it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When they, when they make that crack in your neck, you're like, oh, my God. Because they, my, mine does it anyway. If I tilt it sort of there. Yeah. You're joking. Yeah, just that was my neck then. It just oh does that God. noise. Like three or four it's, times a day. It's, it's the kind of thing that three times out of four you think it's going to work, and then that fourth time you're going to have a stroke. The thing I found more terrifying was when he went at him with a chisel, which I'd never seen before. I've never seen that. The bit where he brings out a mallet would be the moment where I'd be, yeah. well, maybe we'll, well do that next week. You know, I'd, we'll I'd, 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 I had a bad back a few years ago, and I saw an osteopath, and she sorted me out. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. But she, she never got a mallet and a chisel out. <laughs> It was just it's a American, bit, of, though, isn't it? bit of basic manipulation. Yeah. I mean, I've Stuff. never even heard of that. I've never seen someone hammering someone's shoulder and going, does that feel a bit better now, Roy? And he's like, yeah. yeah also, does, the, yeah. the really, really terrifying thing is the man's never in his life been able to touch his toes. He gets manipulated with a mallet and a chisel, and then he's able to do it. Yes. Mm. How on earth does that work? I think that chisel, mate, when you watch it, it's just a, it's a gimmick, isn't it? It doesn't look like he's hitting it that hard. No. It was like I went to see a guy who, when I had a few back problems, and he was like, you lie down on the bed and you push your legs to the left against his body. Yeah. And oh, you have yeah. some level of success. And then you push them to the right and you can't, you, there's no strength at all. And he's like, oh, there's, there's a problem with, what? and immediately I just thought, but you weren't trying the first time. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. think, I didn't think, oh, yeah. okay, what you're going to do now is, stroke my knee and tap my forehead and I'll yeah. be all right. Honk me off. Yeah, honk me off and I'll be perfectly fine. What's going to happen here is you're, you're going to touch my knee six times, honk me off, and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to pay you £40. I'm going to be 40 laughing 40 about honked off and... all week. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them, um, like I said, I, I've been to, to other Kairos and some are real charlatans. I, do, I don't believe in stretching. I don't stretch before. We should be like having a stretch before they play sport yeah. and warming up. You don't believe we in do, that. We, we, well, you, we coach the same kids yes. rugby team stuff, yes. right? And you'll see you'll be up in a place called Penturk, which is north of Cardiff, and it's freezing cold on a mountain, right? Yes. And there's these little kids turning blue. They're so cold, right? And you want to spend five minutes with them doing their stretches first, like doing the hamstring stretches and doing the... It's bollocks. Yeah. It's absolute balls, isn't it? Well, Just it, get them running around quick and let's have a game of rugby. We're going to stretch your quads out. I'm seven, mate. <laughs> All right? I can literally kiss my own ass. Don't worry about it. We'll just have a game of rugby. Yeah. It's amazing how flexible kids are. What's that one where they put their arm out in front of them and they sort of grab the elbow and pull it across the chest? Oh, what, yeah. what are you what supposed a, to stretch there? What I never a crock quite of shit, know. that is. Is it your shoulder? It's your tricep, isn't it? I don't know. No. 
No, I don't know what it is. See, we don't know. Yeah. You can't feel it anywhere. Or that one where you sort of, you know, you've you got to tilt your head to the side, then, then you've got to make arm circles forwards and backwards, and then and then do the hip. You know the one you hands on the hip and make... the Macarena now. When you, look, <laughs> yeah. when you look like you're in the Pan's People. All about my references, Pan's People. <laughs> they would be four legs and co. Yeah, legs and co. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of my... Uh, my pubescent awakening. <laughs> <laughs> you should trace them off the telly. <laughs> trace the telly. And every now and then you'd be, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be tracing Mike Reed by mistake. I <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, the daft racist. <laughs> Mike Reed doing a calypso. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Did you not think? To, to, to prove he's not racist. Yes. <laughs> How can I be racist? I'm doing a calypso in a proper reggae accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny when you watch it like late night telly, which are a lot, you know, especially in this job. That top of the pops they show on the, all the on BBC Four. Oh, yeah. But they, they've only got about five five ones they can show these days. Oh, thank God it's Simon Mayo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you imagine God. Clients sitting there going, no, no, yeah. definitely not, no. If Steve Wright gets done for something, they'd be screwed by that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Size of him. Have you seen old Steve Wright these days? He he broadcasts Morgan House just off Great Portland Street. There's, just a, there's a greasy spoon opposite. It's a cup of takeaways around there. Well, there's a, there's a greasy spoon opposite, and he has the yeah. same thing before every show, and it's like the gut buster. And it is, it is absolutely... Good, just, <laughs> good luck pressing this guy. <laughs> it's absolutely... And it is... It's it's unfinishable if you're Why do people mortal. do those things? There's one in... Remember the one in Uplands Diner in Swansea? Have you never tried, like, a, a food challenge or anything like that? There used to be one in the... There was a pub called The Highwayman in Roos. I think it's still there. Yeah. They used to do one called The Condemned Man's Meal. I think there used to be, like, a, there used to be like a gallows there, right, from back in the day. Yeah. And it was... Um, it was something like two pork chops, two lamb chops, two sausages, two bacon, two eggs, um, and then you, so basically a huge pl- platter of meat. Yeah. And then a separate bowl with chips and onion rings in it. Yeah. And then they bring out a thirty-two ounce T-bone steak. Right. So that can't be finished. I finished it. You well, joke it. No, it's a, a few of us did it when we were in college. We did it. My mate Simon, who's a prolific eater, he ate it right. But he was like a, he loved eating challenges. That was his thing, right? So I, I had a pint of Guinness there, a nice pint of Guinness there. He said, no, no, don't do that, mate. You want a little sweet cherry? Just sip on it just to get the, just to get the juices going. And then you can leave, leave plenty of room in your stomach for the food, right? So we had a little sherry at this enormous meal. I, and on this particular occasion, I couldn't do it. I've tr- I tried it twice and did it the second time. And then um, his missus was sat next to him, Anne-Marie. But you were out for a meal. This wasn't just like a... This is with our girlfriends at the time. Right? <laughs> Come on, what is this? A shitload of meat. Yeah. Can I, can yeah. I, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to say this. That is what? very, very unsexy, mate. <laughs> I wish I'd have a seven lots of sex tonight. <laughs> 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 Seven lots, lots of sex. <laughs> Describing it as lots of. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, lot three. Four down, three to go. I got to be honest, feel a bit sick as all lamb chops, but I, I know I'm capable of it. I'm capable of it. <laughs> you back your foot. Uh, Seven uh, lots is what I hey, said. Seven no lots is what no, you'll get. No pain, no gain. <laughs> Hey, not a quitter. Oh, turn the light off. I feel sick. I feel sick. <laughs> oh, don't rub it for Christ's sake. Eh? <laughs> don't touch the nipples. Easy. <laughs> steady now. Steady. Whoa, well, whoa, hell of a girl, whoa. Mate. <laughs> so I was going to say that Simon finished, <laughs> Simon finished the condemned man's meal, right? And his missus was, his, was tiny. She was like a, you know. And she, I can remember, she <laughs> She had a chicken chest in. <laughs> <laughs> and she couldn't finish it. <laughs> so he went, are you going to eat that? <laughs> and he fucking had that. <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> right, documentary time. Uh, Ellis is your choice this week. What have you got for us? It is. We had an interesting discussion, I think it was last week on the podcast, 
where we were talking about professionalism in sport and right. how much you want your sports people to train and how much they want to push themselves in, in, in order to see how much they can achieve. And Mike said, well, I, you know, some odd balls will get angry if people don't give 100% in training or that kind of thing. I like my sports stars to be flawed or vulnerable. Yeah. And I thought, well, Mike, I've got the documentary for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Gascoigne, this is about England's most talented footballer over the last 30, 35 years. Paul Gascoigne, who, um, well, was star shone very brightly, briefly for England, really. Uh, Italian 19, year 96 are the two tournaments he'd be remembered for. And I think anyone who was alive then will will have an opinion on Paul Gascoigne because of the player he was. I think what an awful lot of people won't know is his backstory. He was always someone who I looked up to. I still think to this day he's the greatest. Part of his genius, part of his magnificence, is the fact that he is so vulnerable. Without that vulnerable side, I don't think that he would have been the player that he was. Paul Gascoigne is the special one. Oh, he leaves two for dead. Players in the middle. That's all I knew for Paul. I just loved NT and the atmosphere in the World Cup was incredible. It lifted him from being a great footballer to a national treasure. Paul Gascoigne is Gaza. Gaza is at the center of Gaza mania. Gascoigne's expected to become the richest player in the world. Everything was coming thick and fast. You're in a position that most young men would say is a dream. It could turn out to be a nightmare, you know. Gary Lineker come up to us. And he went, Paul, be careful. That's when I found out how bad the press can be. It's frightening, really, because all I want to do is just live my own life. I, I watch a lot of sports documentaries, right? This may be the best sports doc I've ever seen. Mm. It was it was a, a an hour and a half where I was genuinely, if I wasn't crying, yeah, or fascinated, I was laughing. It was it was it was so, Christ, what a eminently likable bloke. Yes. Yeah. And what a fragile human being. But what a bloody, it's like a Shakespearean tragedy. Isn't yeah. It? The headlines are. When he was 10, he was looking after his mate's brother Ugh. because his brother wouldn't. No, because his mate wouldn't. Yeah. So his mate wouldn't take his little brother to the shop. So Paul said, I'll take him to the shop. Well, Paul was asked to take him to the shop. They go into the shop and Paul says, why don't we run out the shop? That'd be great. And his, and his uh, best mate's brother goes, yeah, great. And he runs out the shop and he gets knocked over by a car and killed, which Paul sees. He's in his lap. He's in his lap. He dies in his lap. Spent three days with the, the body in the coffin. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is it's horrendous, mate. I mean, and, and they kept showing pictures of of him as a, as a that carefree young yeah. ten year old. My, my son's ten. This ten year old carefree sports mad youngster. Yeah. I just thought, Christ, what a polax. That would be enough, but that's not the only one. Oh no. Yeah. So then when, when he becomes globally famous, um, he does a piece of the news of the world that says, oh, you want to get out there for a young kid and exercise. And his, I think it's his cousin, isn't it? Well, the piece was about asthma. About the yeah, yeah, the piece was about asthma. He says, he says I've, I've got asthma. Can I, can I do sport, Uncle Paul? And Paul says, of course you can, as long as you've got your pump. And he goes out and he plays football. He forgets his pump. He has an asthma attack and he dies. So obviously he feels tremendously guilty about that as well. Mm, yeah. The two things people know about Paul Gascoigne, and I think you could go up to anyone in the street in the UK and say, what do you know about Paul Gascoigne? He drinks too much. He's an alcoholic, mm. and he was a great footballer. Yeah. Of course he drinks too much. Mm. When you think about the stuff he's trying to shut off in yes. his head. Yeah. And when he was at, when he was at Rangers, he, he didn't understand the sectarianism of the whole Rangers and Celtic thing. He didn't understand it. And you could argue that he shouldn't have been that ignorant but he was that's just that's you know that's the way it was yeah so he was asked to do the sash where you pretend to play a flute because of you know the battle of the boyne and orange order marches and all that kind of stuff so he does it thinking it's a bit like the ayatollah with cardiff city yeah. fans yeah yeah and he does it and suddenly he's getting death threats in the ira and and the, <laughs> the police in scotland are saying oh yeah they're serious well, well they send undercover police over there to to check this bloke out and come back and say yeah he's, he's gonna kill you yeah can you arrest him? I said, well, no. Well, we can't 
only when he comes to the UK, and we can't stay in, a, in an airport for the next six months. So, so the the thing with Paul, Imagine that. the thing with Paul Gascoigne is also his luck with injuries. Oh, it man. beggars belief. Yeah. So he started at Newcastle in eighty five. He went to Spurs in eighty eight. Now he was superb at Tottenham. Yes, and he was brilliant. And then he broke into the England teams. And then at Italian ninety, still only twenty three in Italian ninety. What a tournament! So England reached the the, the semi final. So now the Italian clubs are interested in, and Serie A was the best league in the nineties. So he's he's going to go to Lazio, and it was initially eight million, I think, from what I remember. Right. So is it, so he would have Baggio was the the world record transfer fee of seven million. So he'd have broken that. He'd have been the world's most expensive footballer. Um. And then it's the 91 FA Cup final. And Gaza, because he's born in 1967, he has that very old-fashioned attitude to the FA Cup. He's like, that's all I ever wanted to achieve was to walk up the mm. steps at Wembley as an FA Cup winner. Yeah. And then if I'd been able to do that, I'd have been able to retire on the spot. Now, I vividly remember the 91 FA Cup final. And it was it yeah. was, it was was the Gaza show because he'd, he'd had such a good game in the semi where Spurs, had, as the underdogs, had beaten Arsenal. And he'd scored that free kick, which is from about 35 yards out, by Crazy, the way. That's ridiculous. That what is. a hit. It's very good. What a strike. So everyone expected, you know, they were playing Forest. Everyone just expected Gaza to run the show. Now, he he, he should have been sent off in the first minute, really, for, for, <laughs> for kicking a block kicking in the, the chest. chest. And I remember that. And Roger Milford is the referee. And I remember Roger Milford goes up to him and just says, please calm down. It's an FA Cup final, and I accept that you're wound up, so, so chill out, or I'm going to have to book you, which dates the anecdote. <laughs> so then, 70 minutes, um, it's a wild challenge on Gary Charles, and he absolutely destroys his knee, you know, yeah. tears all of the ligaments, gone. Um, I think, from memory, Stuart Pearce scored from the resultant free kick to put oh, okay. up. And you could tell, you could tell instantly that it was bad. And he was out for months. So he makes this tremendous recovery. I think he's back after eight months. He goes for a night out in Newcastle. <laughs> he, gets, he gets chinned in a nightclub, lands on his knee, and the, and the whole thing starts again. So the move to Lazio is put off again. Now, he only played 43 times for Lazio. He was there for three years. Because he got injured over there. Because he broke his leg in at Lazio in training. He missed a year there. Oh, in the training but session, that's horrific, that footage. Oh, my <laughs> God, yeah. Oh, the footage where they haven't got a stretcher off. and he's screaming, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> but some of the funny stuff, makes. I mean, it, it's the bit when he gets to Spurs and they say, obviously, he's known for, like, hijinks in, in Newcastle. And they say, oh, you, we do, you're going to do something mad, Paul. He said, I'll do something mad tomorrow. And on the way home, he stops off in a zoo. Yes. Go to talk to the zookeeper who lives on the site. <laughs> And asked if he can borrow an ostrich. Because <laughs> he, he's Paul Gascoigne, he says, yeah. <laughs> so he said the next morning at training, they're all doing their drills and stuff, and Gaza rocks up and goes, hey, look what the gaffer just signed. And pulls a fucking ostrich out of the car. <laughs> and, the ostrich, and then he says, we're supposed to finish the session at one o'clock. He goes, have you ever tried catching a fucking ostrich? Yeah. <laughs> and putting it in the back of your car. Oh, my God. And that poor sod who climbs up on his camper van and he just like, takes <laughs> off with him hanging off the back of it. So I, just, I know people, not obviously with no, no with not a, a 1% of that talent, but you know people that have like, got that personality. Yeah. That are very, very up or they're very, very down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he talks about, when he's talking about drinking, he's quite candid about it as well, towards the end of it. And he says, um, I can do teetotal very well. Yeah. But I can do relapses very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and he says when he's drinking, he said, "This is the thing they don't they don't tell you about if if you're an alcoholic or you got drug problems, you you don't do it, you don't start doing it because it's not fun." Yeah. Right? The first time you take heroin, I'm sure it's brilliant, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't, no one would ever take it. Yeah. But then it gets shit and it ruins your life, right? Yeah. So he says, like with, with drinking, yeah, he he's had lots of times when he's been with his friends and his teammates and had a drink and had a great laugh and thoroughly enjoyed it. But then he said, like Elsa, what Elsa said earlier, he says, when you drink alone in the house. Yeah. Because he doesn't like to be alone with his thoughts. Yeah. I think, Christ, it, the tragedies he's been through. 
did that whole thing with the phone tapping. He had his phone bugged for 11 years. He's, he's, he says the, the stories that he's only told his mum that appears yeah. in the paper. And then he falls out with his mum and she doesn't speak to him for a couple of weeks. And then exactly the same thing happens with his dad. And he's just assumed that the two people who are closest to him and that he can trust in the world have decided to sell stories on him to the newspapers. So he then holes up in a hotel and gets mm. really, really drunk, and then he gets sectioned as a result By of that. By his sister. Yeah. If you'd only told your mum something, and you knew that you'd only told your mother something, and then suddenly it appears in the news of the world, and she's denying mm. it, yeah. you'd go mad. And the, the, the level of his fame in the early 90s was... I mean, it was Beatles-esque for a couple of years. Oh, yeah, it was huge. Cup. He was huge. When you got like spitting image dummies and everyone knows Gazza. Yeah, and, and he's releasing singles, Fog on a Tine, all that kind of stuff. There's a, really, there's a nice clip there, mate, with Wogan. I think when people met Gasco and they felt, like sort of Robson and, and those people, you felt that sort of instinct to want to father him or to look yeah, after yeah. him, you know, because he was a, such a fairly damaged goods. But Wogan sort of says, you know that, you know, this is. There's two sides to this, and he's very humble because Wogan says, "I've I've had a s- small taste of what you're going through." Now I yeah. think he's playing his own enormous fame down a great amount there because I mean, yeah, yeah. Wogan's on three times a week on national telly, prime time. Every the whole world yeah. knew. Well, all of Britain knew who Wogan was. Yeah, but Gazi, that that fame was something else, and you think you're not suited to this. But you yeah. happen to have this supernatural, God-given talent at England's national game, in which case, yes. of course, you're going to be hugely famous. It's almost the reverse of stuff you were talking about the other week, where you were saying, oh, you know, of course, footballers have real lives and it stresses them out when they're on the yeah. pitch so they can have crap performances. This was kind of the reverse yeah, for him, where this yeah. was, was that was release. his bubble away from, yeah, and from life. I read a long interview with Paul Merson, and, you know, Merson was a very good player in his day. You know, he yeah. went it all at Arsenal. He played for England, you know, it's, you know, loads of caps for England, and he was saying that you you met up with him at training, and he was just a different gravy, like a different, different class. Yeah. And but he was so damaged, and you just feel so sorry for him. Yeah. And you mm. think, you know, if if you're if you've lived through trauma like Gascoigne clearly had, but you're also. Yeah. Britain's most famous man. Yes. And so you're, you're trying to process his trauma and be Britain's most famous man and play football for England and Spurs and Lazio at the same time. The pressure. And because must your be phone's being bugged the entire time. And your time phone's and bugged. Yeah. yeah. So you don't well, trust your parents ev- anymore. But, yeah. Ev- ev- like, ev- every hell. private conversation is all over. We start, the he starts sending texts to himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which are technically to the people who are bugging his phone. At which point he thinks he's going mad because he's doing that. And he is, because he's sent himself into this paranoia. But it's all true. I mean, the the one criticism of the documentary is it doesn't mention his relationship with his wife, with Sharon. Yes. And it doesn't mention the whole role moat thing. So there are two enormous things that they gloss over because it doesn't fit the narrative. So a lot. Of, I read a lot of the reviews of the documentary, and it's three stars across the board for that really? reason. However, if you're interested in the football and yeah. what made him the player he, he he was, and also the kind of person he was, I think it's exceptional because mm. it tells that story, and um, it just explains a lot of his of his nature and his yeah. personality. I think. Second round of clips then for this episode. Mike, what have you got? Right, this is a clip that I've picked purely because it brings me joy every time I listen to it. Um, it's quite a famous clip now of uh, Brian Johnson, the um, test match commentator, with uh, Jonathan Agnew. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right he hand. He to tried to do the splits over it, and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. And um, then we had Lewis playing extremely well for his 47 not out. Agus, do stop it. Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, he was joined by De Freitas, who um, was in for 40 minutes, a useful little part ship there. Uh, they put on 35 in 40 minutes, and then he was caught by Dujon Fourche. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batted for 30, 35. <laughs> 30, 35 minutes, hit a four over the week keepers. <laughs> For goodness sake, the best thing about this, and I could listen to, to radio coverage of Test match cricket and, and coverage of cricket in general. Yeah, I, I love that well-read, well-educated um, for a sort of Welsh working-class boy. I do I really, I really, I love that sort of effortless upper-middle-class uh, cricket commentary style. I love it. Yeah, and do you know what the odd thing is. It's off-putting with every other sport. Yeah, exactly, mate. And it yet is. for yeah. cricket, you're like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But it fit, it, because it fits. I don't know, it just looks right. And what, and what I love about this is, is <laughs> old John has got bless him. He's trying to keep it together and he's doing so well. And then you can hear the laugh start to come into his, <laughs> into his <laughs> voice. He, he, he keeps plugging away. I love that. And obviously, yeah. what we can't see is what Agus is doing in the background. He's obviously lost it by this point. Yeah. Agus. And so John is just trying to, is trying to stay on it, and he can't do it. And I defy anybody to listen to that two-minute clip and not start laughing. Yes. But he's so well-spoken. I love it. I can listen to that, like I said, test match commentary, and they'll talk about, because test match cricket takes a long time. There's no getting away from it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. A game that takes five full days to play and end up in a draw, right, <laughs> is, is a long time. So they fill it with letters people have sent into them, yeah, cake, cakes they've had baked. They'll talk about the local you know, church fate. It's a bit like this podcast. It, it's about it's about cricket for a bit. Yes, and then, <laughs> but and then most, most of the time of it, it's not. Most, most of the time, the, about, most of the time, Agnew's doing knob gags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and John is just talking about you know what food he's eaten. It's something we do well in Britain. Well, I would say that I'm British and I've grown up with it. But when you listen to our commentators, especially cricket commentators, there's a real art form there. They don't. It's not in your face. It's not. I I, can, I love American sports, as we know. I like, I like American things. Yeah. But a lot of that commentary gets right on my tits because they, they they don't shut up. It's very in your face. Where this is really nice and gentle. I also so, love. Hearing people get the giggles, there's a lot of Beatles outtakes. I'm a massive Beatles fan, huge, huge Beatles fan. Mm. And there's a lot of Beatles outtakes where John and Paul and George get the giggles. And the one I'm thinking of in particular is Annual Bird Can Sing Off Revolver. Right. I don't know, they're this stone because they're recording Revolver, so they were, they were yeah. all into hash at the time. And um, I don't know what happened, but they just start giggling after the first verse. And then they fall well, if you apart. Smoke hash, nothing needs to happen. To <laughs> but, but, I mean, <laughs> but the band, but they're still playing. So the music sounds great. It's a slightly different version of the that, that's on the record. So the music sounds great, but they're trying their best to sing and harmonise, and they're pissed and themselves. Like, I well, there's the listen- Elvis one where he's doing. Yes, the, yes, yes. Are you lonesome tonight? Like, right. Are you lonesome tonight? And he, and he puts a lyric in, which he used to mess around with the band backstage. Yeah. Instead of um. Do you gaze at your doorstep and picture me there? He says, do you gaze at your bald head and, and wish you had hair, right? Right. And then he realises that, that he said the, the, the one they mess around with backstage in a gig, right? Yeah. He starts losing it, right? But in that, vo- in that song, the girl called Cathy Westmoreland was the high voice singer in Elvis's uh, backing group. She keeps going. She, she doesn't miss a note. And there's a big, there's this like soprano voice going behind the song. And Elvis is gone. He's completely yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And Wogan used to play that on, all the time on Radio 2. And that's why I first heard it. Yeah. Yeah, so there's something about I... listening to people giggle out of context. And also with the Beatles, they spent hours in the studio, days and weeks mm. and months. So inevitably, they're going to start pissing about a bit. Well, Test Match Special. I mean, once you clip on, clip on YouTube, once you watch that clip on YouTube, there's obviously links to other clips. Yeah. They're always trying to set each other up, make you say things like Hugh Janus and Hugh Jardon and all these, you know, <laughs> just to just to make each other laugh, right? But this one seems to be like a genuine mistake. Yeah. Well, he was jo- uh, Johnson was incredibly angry after this and really upset. Was he because, really? Yeah. He felt that 
Agnew had been unprofessional and that he'd been unprofessional. He was really oh, hard really? on himself. Yeah, yeah. So that that night, I, th- I think Agnew thought he was going to get the sack. Well, basically, it's a it's a sex joke on Radio Four. Yeah, yeah. Pre-war probably, be- yeah. Probably before that was something that Radio Four do all the time. Pre watershed, but <laughs> yeah. it's um, it, he he thought that somehow he'd let the side down in a very sort of traditional sort of way of looking at things. I just love the word leg over anyway. I, think yeah, it's, it's, I love I love that. As a, as a yeah, imagine yeah. if he'd been... Yeah, I use yeah. leg over all the time. <laughs> Humping is another one you don't hear anymore. Humping. And bonking. Bonking? <laughs> they were no, bonk- that's the proper I was one. bonking for an hour. Oh, yeah. Seven you, times I bonked. Have you bonked her? I bonked no. her last night. <laughs> she honked me, but I didn't bonk her. <laughs> there was a lot of honking going on, but no bonking. <laughs> Seven times and I bonk with England star. Yeah. My yeah. Bonk fest. Bonk fest with Randy England star. <laughs> <laughs> um, my thirty eight double D fun bags. <laughs> so British euphemisms. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I personally <laughs> detest Carry On. I think it's the worst humour. My forty-four double D melons. Every one of those in the windows and Carry On, yeah, just makes me want to go. Oh, forget, fuck, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> just say it. You're adults. <laughs> You're fucking adults. <laughs> if you want to say it, say it. Yeah. Jesus oh, Christ, you're not school teachers, are you? So tiring. I used to watch it. I used to think I'm tired now because of all the innuendo. And, the, and there's a feminist Annoyed. in there. They're, not, they're always like a borderline Nazi. <laughs> Some woman who doesn't want like a beauty contest because she doesn't think women should you know, be judged on getting their tits out in public in front of pervy old men. You'd think she'd be the good guy in this, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but she comes across like she's Rudolph like a Hess. fascist. <laughs> yeah. She goose steps into scene. Look out! <laughs> the feminists are in. And you know, forty-five years later, it is Sir James so, goes, <laughs> so tiresome, uh, like physically tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want a couple of bottles of milk? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, do I? What is it? Just oh, really? Um, I don't know, I'd have to check. Sorry, oh, you talk right. Oh, no, no thanks. <laughs> so they'd lock you up, wouldn't they? <laughs> you said yeah. you're going to get locked up, you fucking weirdo. What are you doing? <laughs> you're 50 years of oh, age, man. <laughs> just like, get, grow up. I'd love if I'd been... Ooh, a bit of crumpet, a bit of nookie. If we'd gone back, nookie. If we'd gone back to the sixties, quantum leap son, and I'd, I'd become some a director, and I was asked to do the latest Carry On film. Day two, I've just snapped. <laughs> Fucking grow up. <laughs> That's a wrap. Yeah. Sorry, I can't. I cannot. I cannot handle this. I just can't handle it. Oh my god. I never what talk. What were we talking I, I about? I can't remember. <laughs> um, I know Jack Charlton. <laughs> what are we talking about? Jonathan know. Agnew. Oh yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Leg over. Well, leg over. The word leg over. Yes. I love the word leg over. Fun bags. Right, L. What have you brought for round number two? A pair of thirty-eight double D whoppers. <laughs> Imagine bloke dick size, do they? <laughs> and underpants what? don't come with it. You don't have like cup size in pants, do you? I, I, don't, I don't buy Frank 38C. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 38 double D cucumber. On this podcast, we've, we've talked an awful lot about um, playing through the pain. Yeah. One of uh, Mike's favourite quotes of all time from Vince Lombardi I don't expect my players to play injured, but I do expect them to play hurt. Correct. Well, for a sport that now is synonymous with people play acting and rolling around and and pretending to be hurt when they're not, this is the ultimate example of playing through mm. the pain. This is Bert Trumpman, 
Man City goalkeeper at the 1956 FA Cup final. Birmingham counter-attack desperately, but Bert Troutman pounces like a cat. And again, but what's happened? Troutman's down, he's injured. Teammates help Troutman to his feet. He tells the trainer he's all right, but the crowd can see his neck is hurting badly. So there we have it. He played with a broken neck. Um, Unbelievable. He broke his neck with about 17 minutes to go. Um, it's a horrendous challenge. Roy Jones's chiropractor comes in with a chisel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horrendous Snaps challenge. Him. What I love about this, and the Pathé Newsreel gets an awful lot of mileage out of this, he, he goes on to make two in particular uh, incredibly important saves, but physical saves, because obviously in, in those days, being a goalkeeper was pretty dangerous. You could effectively headbutt a goalkeeper into the net. And 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 the and the goal would stand. There's um, I think it might be the 1957 FA Cup final, where he's he's charged by the striker. Right. The goalkeeper has his cheekbone broken. He, he's holding onto the ball. He lands up in the back of the net. Goal stands. N- nowadays, you'd end up in prison. In those days, it was just that <laughs> yeah. was, it was the, the perfectly the match. <laughs> reasonable way of scoring a goal. So Troutman <laughs> breaks his neck. Now, in the initial very heavy challenge, he stays down for a bit. Understandably, yeah. he gets yes. up, rubbing his neck very gingerly. He um, seems to rub his neck all the rest of the game. <laughs> he rubs his neck for the rest of the game. Now he makes roll it out, rub my neck, kick that, <laughs> rub my neck. <laughs> now he makes. I think he's broken. <laughs> now he makes he makes two very Cross important saves, physical saves at the at the striker's feet. Again, he gets up, more rubbing of the neck. <laughs> his neck is actually is literally crooked. Jesus and when he Christ. met Prince Philip after the game, Prince Philip apparently said, uh, your neck's crooked. Well, to be fair to Prince Philip, I mean, that's that's mild. He's German, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, it, it could have been a lot of work. a whole raft of material that he decided to put to one side. So, you know, your, 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 your head's the wrong shape and it's pointing the wrong way and your neck is crooked. You sausage-sucking kraut. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> Not really, now, Philip, I'm in pain. <laughs> he didn't realise that he'd broken it until a couple of days later because he got signed off by the physios and then he went to hospital the next day and they said oh it's fine just sleep on it you right. and then he went back for a second opinion and they said yes you've broken your neck did you come back after that yeah he had, a, he had a difficult first season back because he lost all his confidence understandably again because he'd broken his <laughs> neck below his chin <laughs> yeah the, he got an obe and one of the things he got his obe for was for anglo-german relations so if you think about this yeah, he, he'd, he'd been at, at man city for a couple of years already by this point i think he was at Man City by He was a prisoner of war. He was a prisoner of war. Right. And then never went back to Germany. Yeah, so it's the, and, and the Bert Trotman story is not widely known in Germany because he wasn't eligible to play for the Germans because he was playing his club football in England. Okay. So he was at Man City from 1949, I think. You know, this is four years after the war had ended. And there were enormous um, protests against the fact that he was playing for the club. City had a large contingent of Jewish supporters. Okay. And they marched against it and they protested. And the thing with Troutman, I've known this story for years. And the way I was always told it was he, he got this OBE for Anglo-German relations. And even before then, he, he was seen as significant for this reason. He changed a lot of people's opinions on Germans and normal Germans for being such a good goalkeeper and being such a brave goalkeeper and being so loyal to Manchester Football Club. Two carry-on films, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> What I haven't realised until I looked into this yesterday is that he was a, a Nazi war hero. He won the Iron Cross. Christ, was it? So he, 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 did, he did buy into Nazism and, and Hitler. Although you could be an Iron Cross winner and, and not be a Nazi. He was... Well, I'm not, but I just want to make make. I'm, 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 I'm say, I'm, I'm very I'm defensive there, Mike. <laughs> I'm not excusing Nazism. But, it's objectively a bad thing. I'm saying know, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the Wehrmacht, a lot of the of the German, so, you know, professional soldier class would consider themselves to be soldiers, not not. Nazis. Where he was stationed, he was stationed with a lot of Italians, and but he would often. I'm glad we won. I'm yeah, absolutely yeah. clear. <laughs> But he would often beat up Italian soldiers and steal their fags because he thought the Italians were like physically and mentally weak. He was quite a tough bloke, Trump man. Mm. I'm with him on that one. To be uh, honest. <laughs> I just find it extraordinary that in in a game that physical was football was so physical in those days to have broken his neck and he knows he's hurt himself because of the, the awful lot of ginger yeah. rubbing. But what a story! This is why the internet's good, right? Because my dad told me that story about. Uh, Trotman, 
yeah. when I was younger. But, you, you know, when you were told these things in the old days, it wasn't like they were going to show a Pathé News clip from the 1940s on TV anytime soon. Yeah. But now you can just find them. Yeah. You can, you, yeah, you can look yeah. up anything. It looks like a proper poster boy for the old uh, <laughs> National Socialist mind, doesn't he? I mean, you love it, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of no. memorabilia behind you there in the bar. <laughs> It's like that episode you know. of Father Ted. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a place we've gigged here, Al, right? That in the um, the Wedgwood Rooms in Southsea, which is near. Oh, Portsmouth. Portsmouth. Yeah, yeah. With Dinger, remember, the comp bear. Yeah, Dinger's a great yeah, yeah. book. So then, on the way, listen to the pod as well. Hi, Dinger. Um, Hi, Dinger. Driving into the gig, they, they to, there was a, a big advert on the side of pink on the side of a house, like on the on the, the gable end of a house. Yeah. Because there was a, like a Second World War memorabilia place there. And it said Second World War memorabilia. Um, Both sides. Guns. Um, <laughs> well, it did. In Both it teams said, um, covered. It was, like, it was like Nazi goods. Wow. Although it was going in there to buy Nazi goods. Any Nazi stuff, mate? <laughs> Any Nazi stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was just, just browsing. What I, what, I, what I am interested in, though, is... Uh, Obviously, I, I've been I've been browsing the all the allied stuff. <laughs> Have you got any of this? Sort of, you know, there's two sides to every story. Isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Anything access based? Access. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, it's the history. It's the history I'm interested in more than anything. I'm I'm, I'm I'm a real real bloody history buff. Me didn't do, do, didn't do it for O level, but um, yeah, just uh, just just really interested in the history. Doing a bit of research for a book. Here. Um, <laughs> what's the what's the book called? I I like Nazis. The book's called. <laughs> oh. Anyway, Bert Trapman. Yeah. So this choice is kind of due to my fascination with how things happen around sport. Why has such and such chosen that number for their shirt? I'm always fascinated by that in football. How do you come up with number 57 as your... Wilfred Borney, despite being a number nine, number two in his second spell at the Swans to signify that it was sec- his second spell at Swansea City. See, little things like that. Just look like a right back. Though, yeah, it? as you can say, right back up. And just look out of position. But songs and chants and how they come to be part of a club like who was the first person to try go West Bromwich Albion as a yeah, yeah. as a chant there's a great Smith and Jones sketch back in the day yeah where Griff Rhys Jones <clears throat> is a football chant composer right have, this, you, have yeah. you seen that one no I haven't no, no no and he's on a piano going you're going home in a fucking ambulance you're going home in a fucking ambulance <laughs> but those sort of things like how on earth do you start something but then how do clubs and national teams start singing random songs as well? So Ajax yeah. singing Three Little Birds was something that I just found really confusing. I saw, I saw pictures of Bob Mar- one of Bob Marley's sons singing with the crowd, and they're all singing Three Little Birds. I was like, well, that's quite nice, but it's really weird. Mm. I mean, there's obvious associations between Amsterdam and Bob Marley, but I don't know how you get from that to singing songs in the crowd. But this is the story of that. When Ajax came to town, it was a pre-season friendly. Mm. It, it became abundantly clear at the mm. beginning of the game mm. that there was going to be trouble if it wasn't managed. So at the end of the game, when the, uh, I had a phone call from the police to say, look, we're going to keep the Ajax fans in. There's a lot of trouble outside. Okay. Uh, play some music so that they can't hear anything and not get sort of agitated. Right. And so I played Three Little Birds. <laughs> I wasn't to know uh, the phenomena that it was going to create. So it's all to do with the pre-season friendly at Cardiff City. I love that. How random that. is that? I know you do. I know you do. I hate everything about that. I was absolutely that. stunned yeah. when I realised that it was because they played a pre-season friendly at Ninian Park. And they're walking through the area that's about 400 yards from my house. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice to see that, you know. I thought that'd be quite cool for you. Yeah, and nice. yeah, they're they're worried about trouble in Cardiff. Well, so they so. keep them all in and they make the guy who's on the tannoy stay behind and play them tunes while they're locked in. Yeah, yeah. But like chilled tunes. Yes. So they wouldn't hear him kicking off outside and yeah. get agitated. So exactly. They, they said turn the volume up, play something happy. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So he comes up with as chilled out a playlist as he possibly can. And this is the first one. And ever since then, Ajax fans have sung Three Little Birds. Because also, especially for a big established club like Ajax, a big famous football club, yeah, European Cup winners, it's very recent. Like Liverpool have been singing You'll Never Walk Alone since the 60s. Yeah. Although the interesting there were a few, thing... There were a few teams saying it originally. Whether right? You'll Never Walk Alone is it was a general football song until the 80s. Okay. A lot of people sang it. But then it just became stuck with and you know, synonymous with Liverpool. Like United fans used to sing, always sing on the bright side of life, didn't they? Do they? Yeah. Why is it blowing bubbles at West Ham? What's the... What's the... Well, uh, um, I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles was initially... A Swansea City song, or Swansea Town, as it would have been. Right. We played them, I think it must have been an FA Cup semi-final in 1926, and our fans were singing it, and West Ham thought, oh. Like that. I like that. Well, and then well, they well. started singing it, and then now, obviously, it's synonymous with West Ham That's United. one of the best atmospheres I've sat in, I would say, the old Upton Park, when yeah, they sing that. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, that yeah. Is, I, I, yeah. That's yeah, proper. I, I went to Upton Park a few times and it was brilliant when they used to, they used to come out to it. I didn't know this song was called that either. So I, I was No, me too. Did you not? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Why is it called that? Be- um, it's one of the lyrics early on in the song. But you would call it Don't Worry About a Thing. If you, if you were yeah. sat around the table at the record company going, yeah. got this new tune called Three Little Birds, I want to play you. It's, it's the phrase Don't Worry About a Thing, Every Little Thing's Going to Be All Right, repeated for three minutes. Yeah. What should we call it? Three little birds. Three little birds. Al's looking up something. Now he's got he's a Googling. concentration on He's got a Google face on. <laughs> Swansea fans have been singing bubbles at matches in the early 1920s, and apparently West Ham fans were impressed when they heard this in a series of FA Cup ties between the clubs in January 1922. Very good song. Subsequently adopting it themselves. So when did Swansea stop singing it then? I don't know. I'm assuming it was some sort of popular standard of the time. This is like a shit Alexa. Now. It's like Alexa, <laughs> but with a, with a Carmarthen accent. <laughs> <laughs> Ellis, when did Swansea City stop singing Blowing Bubbles? Ellis, play Don't Worry About a Thing because every little thing is going to be all right by Bob Marley. I'm, I'm just, I, just, I just really want uh, the Swans to get the credit we deserve. That's the thing. Well done, mate. You, 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 uh, you copied a song from a musical that got nicked by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Legendary club. It's such a fun song to sing in a Cockney accent. I'm forever blowing bubbles. <laughs> Pretty bubbles in the air. I love the bit in bubbles when he goes, uh, they fly so high up yeah. in the sky. <laughs> then, like my dreams, I fight and I fortunes <laughs> always. I I that's, as, that's as the team yeah, yeah. are coming out. I my dreams are going to fade and I die. <laughs> everywhere. Happy hours. Oh, I forever blow, Does it just sound better in a Cockney in accent than it would in a Swansea accent? United! 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 <laughs> it's gone. Oh, God, I love football. Yeah. God, I Good old West Ham. If I could kiss football, I would kiss it hard on the mouth. And I would thank it and oh, shake okay. it by the hand and say, thank you for the memories, football. I would honk off football in a heartbeat. And general sport. I love the fact that no one speaks like that anymore in London. No, no. Briefly, my daughter spoke like that. <laughs> Your daughter? Well, my her childminder, 16, is from Pekka. Nice. So, Betty, and so she went to school. Now she has a, a modern London accent. But until she yeah. went to school, Betty was like... This time next year, Dad, we'll be Yeah, she, she'd come home. She'd say, oh, an absolute oh, right nightmare. <laughs> oh, a right nightmare. All oh, right, fucking time of it. <laughs> Do you remember when she was snowing? She was only two and a half. Oh, that looks magical, oh, no. that. Look at that. <laughs> Bloody hell. She, she aged as well. Well, she sounds, <laughs> Smoked a lot. She sounds younger She's now. She's on the caption, she full then. strength. Because she was... She goes, <laughs> Fucking pack it in, Dad. <laughs> what a nightmare. Turn it in. What's for tea? <laughs> Fucking cockles. Oh, another bad dream. <laughs> <laughs> I was stamped on by a rhino and I was crying and you were crying. It was a nightmare. Oh, you haven't had a bad dream of you. Yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> who, are those, who are those fucking mugs on the Zoom with you? Did you podcast with another couple of cunts? <laughs> Watch your language, please. 
Right, book time. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll go first. This is an absolutely cracking read. It's Kevin Mitchell, who's, a, I think, chief sports correspondent for The Guardian. You'll recognise him as he's the boxing correspondent for The yes. Guardian. Though he covers other sports as well. It's War Baby, The Glamour of Violence by Kevin Mitchell. And it is about Gerald McClellan. Um, who had a life-changing injury in the ring um, in a bout with Nigel Benn in yeah. February 1995. And, you know, his life was changed on, on that evening. And in this book, he he it, it's a biography of Gerald McClellan, who was a very, very talented boxer. Um, and it was 10 gruelling, vicious rounds. It's it's an unforgettable fight if you watched it. And I, I watched it on the telly when, when it happened. So he goes back and it's, it's the story of Gerald McClellan himself and also it's the story of the fight and also the story of what happened to him afterwards. He's now cared for by his sisters. And perversely, I think if he wanted to, um, if he needed evidence for the argument against boxing, I think this book would actually be a very good place to start. I know that we're, the three of us are big boxing fans on this podcast. but And we've talked about the, the ethics and the, and the morality of it. Yeah. And you know it's 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 a very very sad story. It's 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 unavoidable. It's tragic what happened to McClellan, and he was such a talented fighter. Um, but it's a really cracking book, and Kevin Mitchell's is a really good writer. It's very short actually. It's only you know it's like 175 pages. I could not put it down when I read it. So if you're interested in the um, the far uglier side of boxing, then yeah. I recommend War Baby by Kevin Mitchell. So my book for this week was kind of following on from the one you chose last week, Mike, which was The Paper Lion by George Plimpton. This is by a guy called Ian Stafford. It's called uh, Playground of the Gods, A Year of Sporting Fantasy. Uh, Ian's a journalist, done a lot of rugby journalism down the years, so I've kind of crossed paths with him a fair bit, but he took nine months where he went around the world playing and training with the biggest people he could find. So he plays squash against Jethro Khan, goes running with the sort of Kenyan distance runners, trains with those guys, trains with the South African rugby team. He it was around the time of sort of Redgrave and Pinsent and those guys who he wrote. How old was he then, Steph? He was in his mid twenties at the time. Right, so probably late for me, isn't it? Well, no, I, I still I think that there's a really good TV show to be done of can a regular guy what what would a regular guy look like competing even just training with these people mm. so he goes and he spars Roy Jones and then at the end of it says you know how were you going sixty sixty percent fifty percent what were you what were you doing he just goes twenty yeah <laughs> I didn't want to kill you but. It's a really well written book, and it's really he plays a he comes on as a sub fielder for Australia in a warm up game, sort of behind closed doors against Australia in cricket, because uh, he's trained with them for the whole time. Oh, well, and it's, it's just I'd love to brilliant. Do that. I think the I think the yeah, books like this just fascinate me. Right, I brought a book. This is a, a bit of a follow up, really. I think my first or second book I chose in the pod was um, Jerry Kramer's Instant Replay about the uh, Green Bay Packers' uh, first season that they won the Super Bowl. Um, this is a follow-up that was, well, you know, it's, it's, it's old itself now. It's, it's from 85, but sort of nearly 30 years after the Super Bowl. Uh, Jerry Kramer, again, wrote a book with a man called Dick Shap, and it's called Distant Replay. And it's just bringing back those um, those players from that team, you know, 30 years later, where they're at with their lives. And, and they talk about... You know, the games they've won, games they've lost, things they've remembered, they, you know, things that have happened in their lives. I love listening to old sports people talk about their heydays. Yeah, yeah. yeah especially yeah, when definitely. it's team when it's team sports and they get together and, and they and they'll reminisce. I, I I can't get enough of that sort of thing. Right, that is it for us for another podcast. Thank you for your company, guys. We shall meet again probably this time next week. Cheers, Steph. Cheers, Al. Cheers. Sir. <laughs>